Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, part three of topic six in our database class, I'm going to provide an introduction to database transactions. Let's get started. Now, this leads us to a concept known as a transaction. And a transaction is usually a set of commands. So it's a set of steps that need to be carried out. So as we've studied the structured query language in this class, we've typically submitted one statement at a time to the database. So update this row, delete that row, insert this new row, maybe select some data, but it's just generally one command. The notion of a transaction is that we have multiple things that we need to do. So maybe we need to insert five rows of data, or we need to update one row and delete two other rows and then retrieve the results. And so we have these different actions, these different operations that we need the database to carry out. However, the idea with a transaction is that this sequence of operations, sequence of operations is treated by the database as a single logical unit of work. So these are these logical units of work. So if I have a transaction that involves five different operations, maybe it's two updates, two inserts, and a delete, the database treats that set of five operations as one atomic logical unit of work, right? And the idea here is that every single one of those steps must be successful in order for the entire transaction to be successful, right? If any one of those steps is unsuccessful or if it fails, then the entire transaction is undone. It's like it never happened. So um, to do this, we have to introduce this concept of committing a change, okay? So I think the best way for people to understand this who are not used to this idea of committing a change is to think about some related activities that you do when you are computing that have kind of a, a similar or a related connection to this notion of committing the change. So one would be to think about maybe you're writing a document in, I don't know, say Microsoft Word. Okay, so maybe you're, you have to write a report for a class and you've got your document and you open it up and you start working on it, et cetera. You're making changes to the document, but those changes have not yet been saved. Okay, so they are not yet, they're not yet a permanent part of the document file. Okay, so essentially what you're doing is you're editing the document. You're essentially proposing changes to the content of that document, but they don't become the sort of official version of the document until you save it, okay? Until you save it, they're just proposed changes. And this is a very similar concept to this notion of committing a transaction. So if I have a, a database transaction and it contains, I don't know, five or six separate operations, the idea is that each of those operations may be changing some data in the database, but those are only proposed changes Right? They do not become saved until we commit those changes. Okay? So once we commit the changes, they become a permanent part of the database. If we do not commit them, then they are undone via something called a rollback. And it's like none of them ever happened. So it's like if you went into your Microsoft Word document and you made 10 changes to it, and then you closed the document without saving it, it was just like none of those changes ever happened. The version, the official version of the document that was there before you made those changes that ultimately you didn't save is exactly the same as it was before. So a similar kind of scenario that might help to reinforce this notion of committing changes would be, I don't know, like sending a text message. Okay. So maybe you're sending text messages to your friend and you start typing something and so on. And it's not official. It's not, it doesn't become an official part of the thread. It's not sent to them until you press that send button, right? Until you press that send button, you can edit it. You can change it. You can edit it. You can delete it. So it would never happen. It's just that you're proposing content for a text message and it doesn't become 
official until you send it. So it's the same kind of concept, right? We're proposing changes to the data in the database, but those proposed changes do not become an official part of the database until we commit them. So this notion of transactions and committing the transaction are going to be important in our understanding of concurrency. So let's take a look at some examples of a transaction and we will, through these examples, understand why the notion of rolling back a transaction if something goes wrong is important. Remember the, the big idea here is that a transaction typically contains multiple operations, multiple steps. Right? It's trying to do more than one thing, but the entire transaction, that set, that collection of steps is treated as one thing by the database. So if any of those steps fails, the entire transaction fails. Right? So I might have a hundred operations and I could have completed the first 99 of them successfully. But if operation number 100 fails, then I have to undo those previous 99 things and the entire transaction will be fit, will fail. That is none of those proposed changes will be committed to the database. And in this way, and this is a key concept, we are protecting the database or the data in the database from anomalies. Okay? So the idea of a transaction being treated as a single logical unit of work, even though it involves multiple steps and ensuring that every one of those steps is successful in order for the entire transaction to succeed, this helps us to avoid database anomalies. And we'll see here in this example of uh, why this is the case. Now, I first want to, uh, before I get into this, I want to comment on the fact that I don't like this database design. Nobody should be storing order information in a customer table. It's a bad database design. We know that that's not the case, right? We should have a separate table for customers, separate table for orders, but we'll go with it in this case. So let's imagine that this is uh, for some reason, some sort of denormalized database. It's not fully normalized and we're storing information about orders in a customer table for some reason. Okay. So let's begin by looking over here on the left. And this is the official version of the data in our database before a transaction begins, All right? So we have uh, three tables out here, right? You can see that we've got this customer table and it holds, uh, currently just has one row of data. You can see we've got information in here about the sales of 400 baseballs to this customer for $2,400. Well, I guess baseballs are $6 each. And then we have the salesperson table, right? And this is maybe where we keep track of the total sales that each of our salespeople has for the month. So maybe we pay them like a salary plus commission or something like that. So by keeping track of their total sales, we'll know what sort of commission to pay them at the end of the month. And then we have information, detailed information about each order that we store down here in the orders table, all right? And you can see that to our state of the database, prior to the transaction running is that maybe our, the disc on which we store our orders is full. Okay. So we are out of, let's say we're out of space, out of disc space out there. Okay. Now, so that's our before, this is like the official version of the database. And now let's imagine that we have a new sale. In this case, our salesperson is going to make a new sale and uh, we're going to want to add that sale information to our database. Now this task of adding the sale information to the database involves multiple steps. Okay. So these steps are described here. So we'll do this from top to bottom and we'll assume that this is time. So like time is flowing from top to bottom. Okay. So the first thing that we need to do to record this new sale in our database is we need to add information about the new order to our customer table. And that's what's being done here. Okay, so we're going to add this new row out there. So this is a customer number 123, order number 8,000. This customer is purchasing 250 basketballs from us for the low, low price of $6,500, right? So that's part of the sale information that we need to record, but it's not all of it, right? To fully record the information, we have two more things that we need to add to the database. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to add information about this sale to our salesperson table. 
so that the salesperson who made the sale can receive credit for doing so. So you can see uh, this was a $6,500 sale. And uh, let's say that it was salesperson Jones that made the sale. So we need to update salesperson Jones's total sales. Remember previously they were at $3,200. So since this sale is $6,500 worth of basketballs, we add $6,500 to $3,200. We're going to update this value to $9,700. Okay. So at this point, we've completed two of our three steps. That is, we've recorded information here in the customer table about the order. We've updated our salesperson's total sales for the month. And then our third step would be that we need to add this order information to the orders table. Okay. However, when we try to do this, we get an error because the disk is full, right? There's no storage space remaining to record information out here about order number 8,000. So we're out of space in our orders table and the database then would not allow us to record that information in the order table. So if we stop here due to this error, you can see that we will now have anomalous data in our database, right? There will be errors in there because the complete set of information that we needed to enter in order to record the sale was not entered, right? We only were only able to successfully complete two out of the three steps. So we recorded the information here and we updated the salesperson's uh, sales there, but we were not able to actually add the order to the orders table. So now we have these kind of anomalies out here, right? Like this salesperson's total sales are going to not sum up to all of the orders that are associated with that salesperson in the order table. Right? And we'll have this information about an order here. So this customer placed an order, but we were never actually able to store that information in the orders table. So now we've got some bad data in our database. And this is what can happen if we do not have adequate mechanisms for handling concurrency control or transactions in place. Okay. So remember, when properly implemented, a transaction that involves multiple steps is treated as a single unit of work. So in this case, if we had proper transaction control in place and we were able to successfully complete these first two steps, but then the third step failed because the disk was full, then we would undo these previous two steps and return the database back to the state in which it was before we attempted to run the transaction. Right? So in that case, we're not able to record the sale because the disk is full, but we also do not have any anomalies in the database, right? All the data in the database are still accurate. Right? So let's see an example of that, All right? So here's an example of processing this multi-step sale process with the transaction handling in place, right? So we start again over here on the left. It's the same as it was before, right? This is the, the state of our database before the transaction begins, right? And uh, here we can see the steps in the transaction, right? So it's written here in pseudocode. So we can follow through the logic and see how the database would process this. So we're gonna begin our transaction, right? The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna change the data in the customer table by recording the fact that, hey, we sold whatever it was, these 600 baseballs or I'm sorry, like 600 basketballs or whatever it was we sold. Okay, so we would do that. And then we would change the salesperson data by updating the total sales for that salesperson from $3,200 to $9,700, reflecting the new $6,500 sale of basketballs. And uh, then we would insert, insert information, a new row into the order table. Okay. So we would add a new row down here for say order number 8,000. And then as you can see, this is where the transaction philosophy comes into play. If no errors have occurred, then we commit all of those changes. That is the three changes we made to the customer table, salesperson table, and the orders table are all made a permanent part of the database. That is, they're saved. It's just like saving the changes you make to your Microsoft Word document, okay? So they now become the official version of the database.
but this only happens if no errors have occurred in any of the steps in the transaction. Otherwise, if an error occurred any time, we do a rollback. That is to say, we undo all of these things that we did up here during the transaction. So it's like they never happened, right? We do not save any of those changes. We just undo them. And the result then is that after the failure on step three, the state of our database, the official version of the data is identical to what it was before we attempted to run that transaction, the failed transaction.